Hello everyone, I'm Michaela Blot. I'm a distinguished engineer with Silings Research and it's a great pleasure to present to you today about specialization in hardware architectures for deep learning, which is a subject uh, which has been at the heart of our research for probably the last five years or so. Now, let me start you off with a bit of background. So I work for Xilinx, which is a fabulous semiconductor company founded about 35 years ago in Silicon Valley and probably most well known for inventing the FPGAs. I am heading the European Research Lab. We're in total around 10 full time researchers and typically we have between four to six PhD students for internships at any stage, even during COVID times. The focus of our research, as you would guess, is FPGAs in machine learning, whereby we're really hands-on in our approach. We're building full systems and do architectural exploration, algorithmic optimizations, and we're doing benchmarking to keep ourselves honest. Finally, important to say that we're doing most of our research in collaborations. We work, for example, with numerous uh, universities, for example, TU Delft and ETH Zürich, as well as customers. Um, for example, in the past, we've worked on the gesture recognition implementation for Mercedes-Benz V-Class model. Now, what are FPGAs? I realize many of you might know this already, but I just want to make sure that I'm not leaving anyone behind. So I, I would describe in my own words FPGAs as the chameleon amongst the semiconductors, as they are custom hardware architectures, but unlike ASICs, they can be reprogrammed. They can adapt the I.O. interfaces, the computer architectures, memory subsystems, you name it. The use case is you have a system like the one that is shown on the slide here, and there is no device on the market that fits the need because you need either different I.O., you need different functionality, or the available devices can't achieve the performance or efficiency targets that you need in your application. And if that is the case, and you really don't want to do an ASIC because it's too expensive or too risky, then you use an FPGA. Or you decide to build an ASIC, and maybe you're still going to use an FPGA for emulation in the, in the steps towards that. So what do FPGAs actually look like? So first, they consist of a sea of programmable lookup tables, or LUTs for short. Latest devices have millions of them, just to give you a feel for the order of magnitude here. And these are all interconnected with a programmable interconnect, which has a very high cross-sectional bandwidth. We have programmable I.O. And with more recent generations, we have novel compute elements such as DSPs, which carry out embed multiply accumulates. And we also have normal um, memory components in form of embedded SRAMs with very high access bandwidth. So this in essence forms a monolithic FPGA, which is compromised uh, of one compute die. More recent generations then leverage something which is called SSIT, which stands for Stack Silicon Interconnect, where one basically packages multiple dies together with a silicon interposer, which provides the cross connectivity in between the dies. And this helps with scaling the performance of the device. And that's all you need to know about FPGAs in order to follow the rest of the talk. So now moving on to the subject of the talk, why do we need specialization in hardware architectures at all? And the reason behind it is that while DNNs have a huge amount of potential and are penetrating many application domains, their associated compute and memory requirements are huge to begin with and growing on top of that at an incredible rate. So according to OpenAI, it's actually doubling every 3.4 months since 2021 whereby in the semiconductor industry, we've been doubling the capabilities of our devices every 18 months. So you can see here, there's by far not enough performance scalability in the silicon required to address the demands of DNN. So there is a massive gap forming in between, as you can see with the black arrow here. The upshot here is that we're hitting the physical limits of silicon-based computing and architectural innovation in essence becomes paramount. To address this gap, we need innovative approaches. And let me say this, there are a lot of innovative and exciting approaches happening from Cerebras wafer scale computing that you might have heard about, 3D die stacking to quantum and even analog computing. In this talk, however, we'll focus on the perhaps less speculative approaches, which leverage specialization in computer architectures to achieve the required performance scalability. 
and we, we refer to those as deep learning processing units or NPU for short, but many people use NPUs or TPUs or whatever names. So let's agree for DPU for now. So there are many startups operating in the space and using this approach, such as Habana, Nirvana, Sambanova, Graphcore, just to name a few. But even hyperscalers are building their own. Think of Google's TPU, AWS, Inferencia, Huawei, Ascent processor, and even in the automotive space, Tesla is building its own custom AI silicon now. So um, that's just to give you some examples. Before we talk about these hardware architectures in the DPU space, I just want to also touch on GPUs as they play a major role uh, in, in the rollout of an acceleration of machine learning workloads. Um, I used to actually have them as a separate, a separate category, but GPUs are increasingly specializing the hardware for machine learning workloads too. So the, the lines here are really starting to get blurred. So let's discuss now popular deep learning processor architectures. In general, we classify the compute architectures by their degree of specialization from left to right. So whereby the most specialized devices are the ones furthest to the right. With the increasing degree of specialization, you, as you'd also expect, we get improved performance and increased efficiency. So we identify two categories here, but there are not really any hard boundaries in between. In reality, this is a fluid spectrum. So on the left, we have the first category. The architecture consists typically of a matrix of processing engines, and these customized for DNN workloads in general. And then, uh, there's going to be a lot more on that in, in a second. The right category we call spatial processes, and these customize for the specifics of a topology. So here, for example, you'd find an accelerator for ResNet 50, for example. So let me dive into more details now on both of these categories, starting with the matrix of processing engines or MPE for short first. So matrix of processing engines look something like this. So we have a chip with a matrix of PEs, which could be as simple as a multiply accumulate, a VLIW processor or a vector processor. And you typically have a bit of on-chip memory buffering, DMA and an external memory subsystem. This is of course strongly simplified, but please bear with me. There's a point to, to all of this. So we refer to these architectures as a layer by layer compute because the way they execute the DNN inferences that they load a batch of input images, then schedule the compute of the first layer, buffer the outputs from this, then execute the second layer, and so on. Batching or processing of multiple inputs in parallel is really important in this case to achieve high compute efficiency. For example, in the first layer, if the first layer had only enough compute to keep four of the processing engines busy, then your utilization of your compute capability is only 25%. So whereas if you process four input images at the same time, you would get something closer to 100%. So these architectures are customized by specializing for pro the, the processing engines in that they only support operators that are required in DNN compute, for example, multiply accumulates, and you don't implement anything that's not needed here. And in the types uh, of ALUs is the other form of specialization. For example, you would find the, the tensor matrix or vector-based ALUs. So on to the next category, now the spatial processors or SP for short. So spatial processors specialize for individual DNNs through customized data flow architectures, where we customize for the specific operations and the specific connectivity in a given DNN. So the DNN is in essence co-created inside the FPGAs and all of the layers have dedicated compute resources in the device whereby the compute resources are proportional to the compute requirements in each layer to balance the throughput. The inputs are then just streamed through the architecture. It's like a pipeline. So this extreme specialization brings advantages over the MP architectures. So first of all, efficiency, we only instantiate what's needed. Secondly, latency, as we don't need to buffer before and after layers. And finally, either lower resources or higher throughput. 
So with spatial architectures, what we can do is I can scale the resource footprint down to fit into really small devices by removing compute resources from each layer. Or conversely, I can scale it up to run at a higher throughput by adding more and more compute resources proportionally to my layers. And if I have enough resources, I can fully unroll my DNN in the FPGA where every operation in my DNN has its dedicated resources. At this stage, my architecture will run at maximum speed and inference at clock rate. So at 200 megahertz, I get 200 million inference per second. So the upshot here is that spatial processors can scale performance, reduce latency, and provide improved efficiency compared to MPEs. So let's talk now about customizing arithmetic, which is one of the most popular forms of optimizations used in both MPEs and spatial processors. The idea is basically to reduce the data types for both weights and activations in DNN as much as possible while I can still tolerate the accuracy loss. So there are a number of direct benefits coming from this. Firstly, it shrinks my compute requirements. So if I reduce my multiplier accumulate from operating at 8-bit 8-bit to 1-bit 1-bit, the hardware footprint of my multiplier accumulate will shrink by roughly speaking 70x. So we've actually benchmarked this for both high-level synthesis and RTL implementations, um, which is shown in the graph below. And what happens when I shrink my compute operator, that means I can instantiate many more of them. And as DNNs are incredibly parallel, this directly translates into performance scalability. So that's the first benefit. The second benefit is that customizing arithmetic directly translates into a reduction of weight memory if I store my parameters at a reduced position. So between 32-bit and 1-bit representations, there is naturally a factor of 32x, and that can make a huge difference. So DNN inference is typically memory bound unless I can move my weight memory on chip. And for example, if you take a ResNet 50 at four byte per, per parameter, I look at over 100 megabyte, which is typically too large to be kept on chip memory. Whereas at 8 bit or 1 bit, you are now looking at 25 megabyte or 3 megabyte, which you might be able to store on chip. And finally, it also saves power in actually two ways. Firstly, by staying on chip, I save significant power. See table below. This was published at ISSCC for 40 nanometer ASICs. So DRAM reads cost 640 picotool per operation. So compared to upper, uh, other operations, is really expensive. So if I don't have to go to DRAM, I'm going to save a lot of power that way. Secondly, reducing position operators inherently require less energy. So for example, compare here the 32-bit add compared to 8-bit add. There's a factor of 3x in between to, uh, to save. So in, summar in summary, customizing arithmetic brings performance, resource, memory, and energy benefits. However, it requires co-design because you actually have to retrain your, your DNNs for reduced position. Let's talk also for a moment about the granularity uh, of the customization. So in the context of MPEs, let's say I customize my processing engines to operate with int 8. And as I'm doing a layer by layer compute, the implication is that all weights and activations over all layers have to be int 8 then. So this is shown here on the left hand side. In the context of spatial processors, I have much more liberties as every layer is created separately with the precision required. So I can have different positions, not only between weights and activations, but also in between layers. So it's a complete mix and match of positions possible. So with spatial process, you get a much finer granularity in customizing, which allows you to exploit customized arithmetic to a much larger degree than you can do with the MPEs. The challenge with all of these specialized solutions is how can we enable a broader spectrum of end users being able to specialize hardware architectures and co-design solutions. And for this, we've created the project FIN. So the mission with FIN is that we aim to provide tools and platforms for exploration of CNN computer architectures. 
It is intended for researchers such as yourself to give you the tools to experiment. And it's an end-to-end -end flow which allows even machine learning engineers to create specialized hardware architectures on FPGAs to specifically exploit spatial processing and custom precision as we've discussed over the last few slides. It's designed as an open source project to give you the flexibility and transparency for the fast changing landscape that we're dealing with here. So if you have a layer that you need to implement and it doesn't exist in FIN, it's, it's completely straightforward to, to add your own. So FIN consists of three components to train and deploy neural networks. And as I mentioned before, it's end to end. It goes from your, your DNN all the way down to working hardware. So the first component is Brevitas, which is a library for training a quantized neural network in PyTorch. Output from Brevitas is a reduced position neural network in a ONEX intermediate representation, which is then fed into the second component, which is the FIM compiler. The FIM compiler then handles the hardware specialization. It optimizes and then code generates what we call a high level synthesis design. So that's a C++ description of your neural network that can be synthesized into a hardware design. This is then packaged and exported as, as, uh, as a piece of IP with simple streaming interfaces such that it can be integrated into other designs. So this comes then in the third part of the flow the, where the exported IP can be integrated into a larger design, which can be either a custom hardware design, or it can be a number of provided infrastructure designs, in which come, by the way, with Python runtimes. So be, um, beyond the cybersecurity example, which we're going to show you in, in, in the next section of the talk, there are many other use cases, platforms, data sets, and topologies that we or colleagues in the community have implemented. Um, so first of all, we're spreading both embedded and server class platforms, as well as single node uh, implementations, as well as multi-node implementations. Secondly, we have many more applications. Uh, radio modulation classification is a current one we're working on. Speech recognition, face mask detection, object recognition with prosthetic hands. Those were actually done by colleagues from the Technical University in Munich. Um, optical character recognition, playing card for solitaire, playing robot arm, just to give you a feel for those. And we've worked with many different types of topologies from multi-layer perceptrons to standard convolutional uh, networks, YOLO variants, mobile net V1, ResNet50, LSTMs, quartz nets, and so on. So in regards to status and results, we have gained nice traction with the open source community. Meanwhile, we have received over 1500 GitHub stars over the collective repositories, and the number of downloads has just passed 60,000. Bear in mind, hundreds of downloads could come from the same user. We had over 1800 unique visitors and 500 unique clones on our repositories in just the last two weeks. So without dissecting the numbers too much, this clearly shows there's a nice adoption in the community. Similarly, we have early customer engagements, in particular the one uh, that, which we had with Daimler in regards to the um, gesture recognition system in the V-class model. But there are also others, for example, the, in regards to um, ML and space together with ESA. In the research community, we can observe that others are building on top of our innovation. We have meanwhile over 800 plus citations and won multiple best paper awards. And there is plenty of training material available if you're interested. We have demos, we run regularly tutorials, training videos on YouTube. And there are even some universities adopting FIN for teaching computer architecture and machine learning. Um, for example, at Stanford, that's already running two years in a row, Charlotte and NTNU. Overall, our aim is we're looking to grow the community and build up industrial applications. So if you would like to collaborate, we would love to hear from you. Let's take a look now at what we can achieve through these specializations in hardware architectures. So here is an example for line rate traffic classification as part of a network intrusion detection system where the intent is to detect malicious um, traffic as uh, those sent by hackers, viruses, or malware. 
So this type of traffic classification is traditionally implemented by hand-coded rules, but neural networks are emerging as a popular alternative. So the goal here is to implement such a system whereby the application requires very high throughput and low latency. So to avoid introducing bottlenecks on the network, the classifier needs to be able to process packets at line rate, which can be hundreds of millions of inferences per second. So the classifier is, in addition to this free throughput requirement, also really latency sensitive, as I need to buffer all the traffic, all the incoming traffic, while I'm deciding what to do with the individual packets. So every millisecond of traffic translates into tens of megabytes of buffers. We're also, by the way, the popular, we're using, by the way, the popular data set from the University of South Wales. Um, links are shown at the bottom of the page in case you want to check it out. So let me show you now what we can achieve here with spatial processing with FIN compared to standard um, MPE approaches. So we consider two implementations. One is Vitus AI as a form of matrix of processing engines shown here on the left. And one of them is a, is a fully unfolded FIN data flow architecture. All implementations use the same DNN topology whereby the 8-bit variant in Vitus AI is retrained with Brevitas to generate a 2-bit highly quantized variant, um, which we use, of course, for, for the FIN implementation. And both of them are similar enough in accuracy. Let's take a look at the performance now. So Vitus AI delivers 22,000 inference per second, while the FIN we can achieve 300 million inferences per, sec uh, per second. So that's over a thousand X faster. And it's not only a speed up, but also in absolute terms, sufficient now to service a hundred gigabit per second communication link. If you remember the throughput requirement from the previous slide. Similarly, latency reductions are huge, right? So from 26 microseconds uh, in the MPE implementation to 80 nanoseconds, which brings profound benefits on packet buffering needed. Finally, let's look at the hardware resource implications of this broken into compute and memory separately here. So in regards to compute, we're reducing the footprint despite the speed up, whereby the actual size depends on the actually trained weights as they get absorbed into the logic. Overall, we saw the FIN implementation to get as small as 8,000 lots thanks to this uh, fine-grained sparsity that, that uh, FIN can actually impl implement. So that's actually a significant reduction compared to the Vitus AI implementation. Memory is a great story too. As it's fully unrolled, the memory gets absorbed into the logic and no pre-RAMs and new RAMs, uh, which are the embedded SRAM components inside the FPGAs are actually needed. Overall, we get 1000x performance improvement over Vitus AI at less resources, achieving 100 gig line rate for 150 million inferences per second as classification rate. The benefits come from the data flow, so the spatial processing, the reduced position, and the fine grained sparsity where synaptic connections with zero weights get um, removed during the synthesis optimization. And with that, we're already coming to the end of my talk. So in summary, there is a spectrum of innovative architectures emerging to address upcoming compute and memory requirements in DNNs. Specialization of hardware architectures are critical to scaling the performance in particular for extreme throughput applications as we see, for example, in communications. We looked at the network intrusion detection example, which showed the tremendous benefits we get from quantization, so from extreme reduced position implementations and from the spatial implementations. Now, finally, before I finish, I'd like to briefly point out that we provide free infrastructure for our experimentation. And this is, by the way, not just for FIN or DNNs, in, um, but this is much more general. Um, we provide this in form of these academic compute clusters. There are four of them worldwide, two in the US, one in Singapore and one in Europe at the ETH Zürich. They are completely free to use and specifically intended for you as an enabler for the research community. So it provides you a playground to experiment with innovative computing architectures in the context of data center and HPC applications. 
Now, they're, they're quite different from AWS because they're much more flexible. So you can implement, for example, different shells on them. They um, offer network nodes, like where you can um, play with direct node or node com um, communication. And they allow you to share the same hardware for research collaborations, which always is, is a benefit. So there are many example applications emerging that run on this XECC, which can be found at uh, the shared uh, GitHub repository, and you can see the link here on the page. So just to give you a flavor of what these centers look like, so the one shown here is the one at the ETH Zürich. It has five uh, servers stuffed with a total of 10 high-end FPGAs, and there's, for example, also HPM uh, devices included in this. They are all interconnected through 100 gigabit Ethernet network connectivity. And if you'd like access to this, please be in touch. As, as I said, it's completely free to use for anyone working in the research community. Yeah, and with that, um, I'd like to conclude. So thanks so much for listening, and I'm looking forward to your questions. <laughs>